And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Steel and Scale, his for his debut project in this we weird and wonderful world of ro of rolling dice and drawing cards. <laughs> he is he is not in he is not sane he is not insane but he is moderately sane. <laughs> Rel or sorry, relatively sane. Mr. Hey, Sam Barker. Sam. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming on. I could have done the Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe gag of I became insane with regular bouts of horrible sanity, but this isn't that kind of game. <laughs> so, one of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, right. <clears throat> walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Ooh, okay. Um, so this is interesting, because my first introduction to tabletop role-playing games as a whole didn't come from any sort of official sources. Um, when just like in early sort of teens, we, me and my friends just started just sort of rolling dice and determining outcomes. <laughs> we didn't really have a system to work off. We didn't... I mean, we'd heard of stuff like D&D, but uh, we didn't really have any sort of game stores nearby, um, so we didn't have any of the materials or the books or the dice or anything, um, except for, like, to this typical sort of six-sided dice that everybody has. Mm. Um, and just rolling that. Um, and over time, we sort of developed that a little bit more, developed a bit more of a system to it. Uh, I think... Our very sort of first couple of like games were just basically make up a character, whatever you want, <laughs> um, uh, roll some dice to see what stats you have based on some basic things written on, you know, like strength, uh, charisma, agility, all that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then just roll two six-sided dice get under that result that's a success um and it was obviously very very simple and uh i mean that is obviously the kind of system that i see echoed in a lot of rules light games as well nowadays obviously with a bit more like structure around them but like that kind of basic introduction premise um was what we started with um and then by the time we'd sort of got around to like looking into official games uh, pro actual products at D D. Um, we kind of had latched onto the stuff we'd already made and just decided to carry on with that. Um, I mean, did we you know, dipped our toe into some other systems, but mostly we were just making stuff up as we went. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, given, given that, was that, was that the pattern on how, on how things went, even when you started finding out about games about um, tabletop games proper yeah yeah um so as i say like yeah we um did a, like, a bit of D, &D a bit of um uh, other games uh stars without number was one i tried a bit um eventually just kept on going back to the systems we'd built up over time and over the course of pff, many years uh, that says sort of developed into this system that i've now got this Kickstarter for that we're now hoping to release Steel and Scale. Mm hmm So with that in, with that in mind um, is st let's talk about Steel and Scale mm -hmm. which give, given the given the um, mix of elements that we're, that we're going with was this a case of a, ga a game that you had been Run, running within your lo within your local tables for a while and just mm. expanded outward. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, it started as a pretty typical sort of fantasy setting. Uh, we were not, you know, uh, breaking any boundaries uh, when we started. We wasn't super innovative. Um, but then we just decided after we'd finished our first big campaign, which was like a couple of years. 
um, I sort of decided to advance the setting by I think it was 70 years. And so now that's taken us to a bit of a more unique setting, a bit of a more um, uh, diverse world uh, with all this technology that comes around with industry um, and also the, the fantasy elements that were there always. Um, and yeah, we've been playing in this for a long, long time um, with our uh, the main friend group that we started with and with other people we dragged in over time. Um, a lot of different groups, a lot of other people within that friend group have picked up the system that we've been working on and run it themselves with the groups that of people I don't even know necessarily. Um, so it's really kind of developed and grown organically. Um, and over the last, like, I would say, like, year to year and a half, I've been really bugging down on getting it refined and into a state where it can be a publishable product. Uh, and given the uh, real positive response from everybody who's tried it out, everybody who's GM'd in it, everybody who's played in it, we think it's it's you know it's worth putting out. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So with that in, with that in mind, uh, the what I, what I did find interesting is going for, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, of a bit of an art deco approach with mm. um all, with a lot of the visual aesthetic. Mm. Um, was. Was that something that just happened, that just accidented into, or was that um, part of the plan when you jump when you jumped ahead a few years with the setting? Uh, yeah, um, so definitely, I, I have. Well, I am also the primary artist with Seal and Scale, and I have been an artist been doing that kind of stuff for a long time. So visual aesthetic has always been one of my main priorities whenever I'm making anything. Um, so yeah, with that sort of time jump that we did, with that uh, bringing us into this more industrial setting, I wanted to bring along a lot of the aesthetics that came with that, and I think this sort of Art Deco uh, with a little bit like Art Nouveau um, of that sort of like 1910s, 1920s time period really stuck, um, and is a great sort of like aesthetic of the system that has sort of carried on throughout lots of the games that we've done in it. Yeah. And so we wanted to obviously reflect that in the book and make it sort of stand out from the regular sort of fantasy kind of book style. Which I definitely appreciate since I've I've been very public about having issues with how limited people view fantasy. Mm. Um, this idea that if that in order for something to be fantasy, it has to be doing that British Isles pasti pastiche <laughs> a, la t a la what I call the Tolkien melting pot. Yeah, <laughs> and I've got nothing against Tolkien's work. I love his work to death, but I don't think that's what I should have to do if I'm doing fantasy. No, um, I remember. I remember. I've mentioned this before. I remember going on forums and seeing people say that Planescape was too weird to be um, fantasy; that it should be um, SF oh. instead. Which I'd say. I'd say it's. I would say it's. It's only. It's only weird if you. If you think that. Um, you need to have you need to have medieval looking castles in order for hmm. something to be fantasy. I was being semi sarcastic yeah. at the at the <laughs> point at that time, but I think I think you can see what I meant. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you are justifying so much of the world with magic as a, as opposed to technology, I don't think it is sci fi. It's definitely a fantasy. And of course, the other the other thing is. I'll... I'm gonna go out on a limb here and get and guess that that you've gotten a few people who have presumed um, steampunk with steel <laughs> and scale, and from everything I've seen, it's not steampunk. It's not steampunk. Um, don't get me wrong. I I, I had a steampunk phase. Everybody has, um, but I I it's also kind of an oversaturated aesthetic, I think. And personally, I'm more towards diesel punk um, as an aesthetic uh, and definitely with with the more sort of wacky technology that we have in the setting like the the machinery the robots the the um, sky ships and all that sort of stuff that kind of leans towards that uh, diesel punk but a lot of it is just regular 
1910s, 1920s technology and the regular stuff that existed, um, which is, yeah, uh, so there's a bit more of a down-to-earth element in a lot of it. Mm-hmm. So, and with that, with that in mind, since we're ta- since we're talking about the um, 1910s and 1920s as a mm-hmm. as a aesthetic, um, yeah, that's get that's going to put us right around the right right around dur- um, either during or after the war to end all wars, as it was known <laughs> at, at the time. Um, yeah, would you say that you're even though even though this is its own setting this isn't trying to be so, mm-hmm. some um earth variant no. would you say that you are that you are leaning um in that that kind of th- into smack dab in the middle of a world war or at, or post war um it's fun that's an interesting question to explore um and i do think that the setting is well the, the book itself the rule book it's not obviously it's not setting agnostic, but it is malleable, right? You don't have to work within my homebrew world. Uh, you can you know make up your own sort of stuff for that. Um, but obviously, a RPG thrives on conflict, um, and whether that be small stakes conflicts or nation spanning conflicts, um, that's up to the person telling the story. And certainly, we have in our own campaigns in the setting run lots of campaigns that take place during wars or uh, where war is a constant background threat um, uh, whether the players are directly intervening or whether they are just trying to survive mm-hmm. so I would say yeah conflicts in that sort of because uh, I definitely think with the industrial age and with that advancement of technology and advancements of weaponry um, war is inevitable uh, in that kind of time period with that kind of aesthetic uh, conflict is inevitable and it, so it does it does take a part in it but it's not a requirement mm-hmm. and now with now with that in mind mm-hmm. and I know I know I say that a lot but that's just a that's just a bit of a <laughs> habit um Good segue. there's a concept I've talked I've talked about called all roads lead to Rome and this isn't a literal sense kind of thing. It's more in reference to how, with the vast majority of games since I want to I want to say the late nineties, mm-hmm. um, you have this concept of a core mechan a core resolution mechanic that un- that unifies everything, as opposed to the collection of subsystems that was prevalent in the er- in the early days of role playing, like in the eighties. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. Most which that subsystem thing is more of a artifact of the wargaming scene. Because if you look, if you look at most war games back then and even now, mm-hmm. you can you kind of have that. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a sub, a sub, a die resolution system for one for one set of circumstance, and then for a different set of circumstance instead of this one die system that it yeah. that everything spirals out from. Um. What would you say is the Rome in steel and scale? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Um, the room of the system, the the core resolution mechanic, is, is something that people will be familiar with. Uh, I'm not breaking the new ground here. It is you roll a d20, you add your attributes, and you add any relevant skills. Um, so, you know, people refer to it as skill plus attribute. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's very simple and yeah, it's very familiar. Um, but there are the ways that your sort of abilities and your uh, position affects that within the game allow it to be very sort of versatile, and the GM can draw a lot from it. And and I'm, are you are you doing? Um... Natural twenties as automatic as automatic hits and the like. Yes, yeah. Um, this is honestly a more of probably a personal preference thing, but I always like a critical success. A nat twenty is always a success, and a natural one is always a fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because it was these chance, you know. Even if even if you are just a commoner fighting a heavily armored mechanical knight, you can still get that crit. 
<clears throat> Although, I think you and I have both have both had our share, our fair share of stories of somebody rolling, even though even though there's no way they could, they could <laughs> win, they, and going with the whole I've got a five percent chance. Then they roll <laughs> yeah. and they get a natural one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and it, you know, but I think those moments just lead to good story. I think I've been very fortunate with my group that I've been playing these games with, uh, and my friend group that I tend to Dungeon Master for, Genium Game Master for, um, in that they always take failure as there's always run with it, right? Um, so, like, even just uh, recently, in fact, I was running a session where the, the socialite charisma character got their natural cr- critical failure on their check to schmooze with some noble, and then it just revolves, well, rolled into this massive argument that got the entire casino looking at them, and it was just hilarious for everybody involved. <laughs> and that's, that's good. So even when you have all these bonuses, having this chance to fail is always... It leads to a good narrative. It leads to good moments. Hmm. And when it comes to, I noticed with the concept of die boost that you that you have hmm. is that is that is that meant to be the primary me- means of like of like situational bonuses and um, bonuses from your from your um, kit. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So the six archetypes in in the game uh, represent your different ways to adjust your fate, as it were. Um, with like the expert being the best for out of combat situations, because you can add those two six sided dice to uh, skill checks, so not not combat checks. Hang on a second, folks. Because Discord decided to mess about. Welcome back. So, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Discord decided to derp on me. Uh, it does that. Um, are you recording? Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. <laughs> um, no worries. Uh, do you, where were we? Um, you were meant. It was on um, dice boosters. Right. Yeah. Um. So the the yeah. So the six archetypes represent you in different ways to basically address your fates. Um, there are lots of games, uh, game systems that allow you to adjust your roles after you've made them, and I think it's it's good. It's a good sort of um. Uh, versatility allows you to succeed when you really want to at the cost of a resource. Um, but with seal and scale, your six archetypes mean that you're good in one area, and you can you can adjust your roles in one area. Uh, and each person will be uh, ideally have their special speciality in that way. Mm-hmm. With now, now. Of course, with that in, with that in mind, there's also the fact that this is a point based affair, mm. um, which is an which is an interesting decision to make when, given given that this is very D, very D twenty based, there would be the um, assumption that that you'd be using um, levels, but you're using you're using a point based approach. Mm. Now, uh, yeah. With that, with that in mind, do you, ha- with this point, with this point-based approach, do you um, have plans on put on putting in what certain thresholds would be? Because that's always the tricky thing with point-based systems. Hmm. Um. So yeah, we do, and we um. So the, it's kind of a mix of both. Well, mm-hmm. it's so you have your character points, um, and you are rewarded character points for completing. Um, you know, uh, objectives that's mm-hmm. determined by the game master, um, and at different amounts of total character points, you do get small bonuses uh, based on your archetype, uh, which is mostly to make each character sort of fit a role in the in the party. Mm-hmm. Um, so your you know your expert archetype character will always be great at the out of combat stuff and the utility stuff and the uh, you know, 
providing bonuses, not necessarily inside a fight, but um, very, very useful outside of one. Um, whereas your warrior will be the person you rely on when when you do have a fight and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, so and you, so there are those bonuses that are kind of like levels, but the main bulk of your kit, uh, the main bulk of your abilities and stuff, that is purchased with the character points, and that gives you really a mass amount of freedom over what you are able to do, what you're able to, uh, the problems you're able to solve, the actions you're able to do in different scenarios um, uh, in, a, in a way that is kind of separate from your archetype, but also can merge with it, uh, allowing you to just make like combos, basically, in uh, fun ways. Mm-hmm. So, move, moving into moving on from that, um, mm-hmm. when it comes to the three main resources, um, HP, energy, and and destiny, um, mm-hmm. as well as well as wounds. Um, now, mm-hmm. three three of those are pr- are pretty straightforward in what in what they're going to be um, doing. Mm-hmm. The one the one that I'm cu- the one that I'm a bit curious about on this is um, destiny. Um, is yeah. that meant to be an extra, like an extra effort system, a la, say, willpower in World of Darkness or um, Edge and Shadowrun? Uh, so Destiny is just uh, the resource you use to use your archetype ability that allows you to add those dice boosters onto your rolls. Mm-hmm. Um, we just made, made it a separate thing from energy because it allows you to not have to worry about running out of your archetype ability, which is obviously one of your core things, mm-hmm. uh, if you're casting too much magic. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just it's just a point thing. You have like three points of it. You can uh, you regain them every day. Uh, you spend one to mm-hmm. increase your rolls in a specific area, basically. Yeah. And <clears throat> of course, I did I did notice when I looked at the. Um, when I looked at the character sheet, is mm-hmm. the fact that you you have a skill list, but not in the traditional sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's our we don't like to tie down skills too much. Um, I think it's a bit more free form uh, you know it's not when you come across an issue it's not necessarily a case of the gmm saying okay make me a persuasion check um it might be more like okay i want you to make a kind of social check here um using whatever traits you think are relevant depending on how you're approaching this mm-hmm. um so then they would look at their sort of trait list uh, and they look at their attributes and they decide okay uh well Maybe they want to approach it in a bit more a charming way, so they might, you know, act that way, or maybe they might roleplay that way, um, or just describe the character being a bit more so sort of friendly, likable, mm-hmm. uh, and then they would get a charming trait in. Um, it's a bit more free from. That's why we don't have like just a list of skills. It's more just like you just write down what traits you have, and then they apply to whatever roles you agree with the GM are relevant. Mm-hmm. And when. When it comes to, um, when it comes to things, li- when it comes to things like action modifiers and act and active responses, mm. um, is it op- is it operating on that same modifier setup with the skill bonus? Yeah, um, obviously the combat stuff is a little bit more, it's a bit less freeform because it's uh, got to be a bit more balanced. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just like you use the attribute plus the skill bonus if you are skilled in this particular area and that's sort of seven through character creation mm-hmm. and i i do see that you have that you have um you you have you have a sort you have if i'm not mistaken a bit more flexible of a def- of a defense system because i do see the skill mm. the skill dr but you have with the um, active and passive responses, it looks like the, if I'm not mistaken, the approach that you have is um, attacking and defending is not a universal affair. Yeah, yeah. There's no just like flat AC to hit or anything. It's um, uh, the defense you're using is dependent on 
the attack uh, yep. so that there may be like a a mental attack a psychic blast may go against your resolve mm-hmm. um whereas obviously a sword attack you can use your you can try to dodge you can try to defend um it's, it's a bit more flexible in that way and it's a bit more tactical as well like you can if you think okay this is a big strong bulky guy but i don't think he's very smart so i'm gonna use the skills i have that contest his like mental stats or that kind of thing mm-hmm. it sounds like rock paper scissors with an extra step it, it is a bit it is a, it's a bit rock paper scissors uh, obviously there will be some obviously boss enemies that are just going to be tough no matter what mm-hmm. um, but for the most part you can it's pretty simple to identify where your enemy's weaknesses lie and maybe you don't have a tool that can deal with that but somebody in your party will yeah, and I'm, I can I can see how th- this is I can see how that's why you wanted to go a bit broad with um ar- with the archetypes mm. and speaking of that I'd kind of like to go into the archetypes that are present and get get a mm-hmm. feel for what uh, what they're going to lean into what their kit is going is going to be like um so the archetypes uh that you see in the preview that shared those are all the ones that exist um mm-hmm. and those are that's basically all they do they they give you some very sort of core benefits um but they don't determine your identity necessarily as a character uh, they don't like determine whether or not you have magic or anything uh, they don't determine um what you need to build into in terms of stats necessarily um but they they give you this kind of role so like your tank uh, is a great sort of simple example um, of just you can take more hits um and uh you can heal using your destiny they're the only ones that don't get to adjust roles but they make up for it by just not dying uh, in a fight um and that's obviously a very useful person to have because mm-hmm. We have the warrior, which is gonna be our, mm. gonna be your standard, um, um, fighting man. Gonna be go- going to be good at, um, general attacking. Not necessarily even. Um, so this, is, as I say, it's it's very sort of versatile, uh, and you can play a warrior who focuses more on magic because that bonus to um, isn't just to attack rolls. That's also, you can also apply that onto your. Like magical ability roles. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's obviously you can uh, go into as a standard fighter guy. Um, you get your quick attacks, which lets you do more attacks. It's a your standard, um, but it's you can play around with it and go different sort of combinations. Yeah, uh, warrior is generally the most all round and reliable one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say. So, soldiers. Yeah, yeah, basically. The whereas the skirmisher is is going to be more about mobility and mm. not getting hit as opposed to as supposed to <laughs> people who want to get get hit. Yeah, yeah, they they are uh, one well, the only people who get any sort of movement bonus uh, skirmishers, mm. uh, and you can just gauge out of combat. You can give yourself bonuses to dodging and um, and just yeah, that's that's for people who want to be able to. Hit and run, get in and out, move quickly. Mm-hmm. Oh, and tank. Well, that's self-explanatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as we explained. Oh, I. Although, the, although there's, fr- although um, there there could probably be a lengthy argument about what about whether you keep the turret on or off. But <laughs> enough, enough about British tank design. Uh, uh, um... But. The Eliminator, would that be your um, assassin? Yeah, that's, that's generally the, vi- the role they sort of fill. Um, mm-hmm. Eliminator is interesting because the systems of Steel and Scale, n- nobody's really invincible, um, and you never really get to a point where you can just, like, you know, you know, in a lot of the RPG systems, especially the high fantasy ones, you when you're really high level, you end up with characters that are just basically can never be taken down. They were ridiculous to hit. They, they're ridiculous amount of health. Mm-hmm. 
with it's... an assistant of Steven Scale, uh, people are more vulnerable because of the wound system. And the eliminator kind of it takes advantage of that. That's the person that you send in to just take out enemies one by one, you know, to chip down bosses. Um, but in the, uh, as a cost of that, they don't get much other bonuses. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically their role. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also, there's, I wouldn't, I've done my own digressions when it comes to that high level issue. And I'd, I'd say it's mm. um, twofold. I'd say it's a, a twofold problem. On one mm -hmm. hand, yeah, you do have games that um, are a bit too, not to, not to make, not to sound too American, but a bit too Monty Hall. <laughs> um, right. And on the other on the other hand, you do ha you do have games where the high level end of play is not properly supported aside from numbers go up. Mm. Um so I don't think uh that's we haven't really seen that be a problem in Steam Scale, mostly mm -hmm. because your High level under play is more about you having more abilities, more mm -hmm. options to you, rather than um, numbers going up <laughs> necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and numbers do go up over the course of the game to represent your growth and your skill growth and stuff, yeah. um, but not to like a ridiculous extent. Um, and yeah, as I say, most of the leveling up quotation marks that you do is is getting a new ability that might do something cool. It's more mm -hmm. like side grades rather than upgrades most of the time. Yeah, I I remember Cipher System talking about that when Numenera first came out. Um, right. But the when the support for whatever reason, the first thing that comes to mind is a combat engineer. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know that, you that sort that? of that sort of te that sort of team player, the the kind of person who's who would be the people making bridges or or making in. Making entrenchments, basically the people ma making the um, the minor things that keep that keep people from um, getting shot at. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, that's definitely a build you go for. Um, uh, support in general, though, is is more about this. Uh, I mean, you can obviously like the others it's versatile, mm -hmm. um, and the biggest role is you just buff other people's roles. Um, yeah. it, it's Possibly one of the their destiny ability can be like, applied to anything, mm -hmm. but like they need they're not giving it to themselves to give it to somebody else. Yeah, um, and they're very handy to have, uh, but not necessarily great on their own. And would you say the expert is the closest thing to a skill monkey? Ooh, uh, depends on what you mean by skill monkey. I've heard a couple different definitions because. Um, uh, some would define that as being somebody who can do everything, and that's not what the expert is. Um, what they can do is they can be very, very good in the things that they're specialized in. Um, so the expert gets this ability that lets them improve their own skill checks, as I, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, which is really handy uh, when you're making social checks or stealth checks or, or any kind of check that you need to succeed to get into to uh, process, you progress your objectives, um, and yeah, they, they they can do that very 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 easily. Um, obviously, they're still vulnerable to rolling critical fails like anybody is, but uh, it's a, it's a good one for those situations. Mm -hmm. So but, uh, they're still limited by um, a tr general sort of skill limit that like nobody can. They can't go over, so they can't do everything. You still need a group with you. Mm -hmm. So, with and of course the of course um with that there is I'd say one of the, one of the other big um CP spenders because the the main the the CP spend mm -hmm. expenditures for archetypes are cer are certainly in the high end of things, but the oh, those aren't um, expenditures. Those are things you get when you reach oh. that level. Okay, Sorry. my okay, my 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 mistake on that one. Um, that ma that makes a bit more sense because yeah. <laughs> the st because the stuff that you'd get out of it, I'm not I'm not entirely sure if that would warrant no. <laughs> like thirty like thirty five CP. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, uh. Those are sort of to represent the general sort of growth of the character over the course of the campaign. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, whereas the whereas the um, talents, I, sp I suppose, are one of the bit one of the big ways that you're going to be spending C CP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and these are kind of bundles of skills that kind of fit together and give you a sort of general identity. Um, and yeah, they cost five CP each. Uh, but since characters are going to be generally around like fifteen to thirty. Uh, uh, when you're playing, um, that, that's not too much, and you can mix and match m multiple of them together. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, I guess I, I guess I could. L I know it'd be tempting to look at talents as the equivalents of, say, feats in so in something like Pathfinder, but yeah, uh, the I... problem the problem with that is mm -hmm. feats in pa in Pathfinder are one off like you get mm. you get it and you get that one thing that's it mm. you've i can see what you mean when you say packages because each of them is giving is giving multiple things like the well i, I have to bring up martial artists because i have to work my gimmick <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. like you get you get brawler so you can do you can do d6 damage with standard attacks which in some games, that might not be as much, but I get the feeling in this game, one d six is gonna be a bit and have a bit more bite. Yeah, HP values are generally lower, especially among like the experts and the supports. Um, mm -hmm. um, grappler lets lets you as long as long as you as long as you qualify lets you well grapple. So that there's <laughs> your rest, and you have a energy based effect with um, self defense. Yeah. Um, that's that's three that's three feet that's um two passives and one a and two actually not not two passives what am i saying one passive one semi passive and one yeah, active and three active i guess uh yeah um and that's generally what a lot of them are um this is not a in this preview this is not a full list of talents mm -hmm. there's there's about uh 28 in total yeah. Um, this is just what we can give in the preview. Mm. Uh, but this again generally gives you a vibe of what they're all like. Uh, and it's mostly there really so that a player um, can open the book and see, okay, what kind of character do I want to make? And then they see this list of basically like roles, like uh, ideas basically for a character, like uh, things they can build around. They can look at that and say, oh, I, I can make a martial artist yeah. uh, and pick that up. And that's the thing they need to be effective at punching people, then certainly. Mm -hmm. And of course, I notice a, a similar thing when it comes to abilities that you that you can learn. I appreciate mm -hmm. that there is a section for martial abilities because so mm -hmm. many fantasy games give uh, martial characters the short <laughs> end of the stick, or yeah. just have it that just or go, just go. Well, I, I'm just. Well, let's let's look at it. The thief has the skills. The wizard <laughs> and the cleric ha have way too goddamn many spells. Yeah. And the, cl and the, and the cleric has just... things, other stuff, other stuff. Yeah. And the fighter just has Hits basic people. attack. <laughs> yeah. But hey, at higher levels, you can do multiple basic attack and get <laughs> and become a and become a lord and get and get hirelings who also are going to be doing basic <laughs> attack. Yeah, I know. I I definitely share your frustration there. Um, a lot of High fantasy games will just not include adequate support for the people and who don't want to be using magic. The re the reason why I find that I find that fixation on just variants of basic attack so frustrating <laughs> is consider consider the martial characters that have been ingrained in pop culture. Mm. Whether let's whether that be whether that be Conan, whether that be um whether that be any of the McClouds, whether from the from <laughs> The only Highlander movie that exists, and the only Highlander TV show that exists. <laughs> Everything else didn't happen, I'll except for, word for that. <laughs> uh, except except for Search for Vengeance, that's good. But the the point is, is that you have you don't you have in those things, or even if I have to use John Wick as a as a recent exa as a recent example, uh, mm -hmm. or just the myriad of um of martial arts movies coming out that came out of Hong Kong. 
you have <laughs> you have people at, you have people attacking, parrying, out, out maneuvering, um, all, yeah. all of that all of that stuff, and when you when and obviously somebody who's a fan of that would want to do an XP of that mm. when they're do when they're making a character in a role playing game, and when you're boiling all of that economy of motion into just one role it doesn't have the same impact yeah yeah um definitely agreed with you there uh and that's why we have a whole bunch of abilities for the fighters yeah um uh, i did note i did notice with within the martial abilities you have some that are listed as tier two is is it a case where yeah. there's a certain number of um, core abilities you'd need to get in order to get tier two, in order to be able to get tier two abilities? Uh, just, or... just one, just one. Um, so obviously, when you have a uh, character point based system that allows you just basically pick up any abilities from anywhere, uh, we did want to make sure that there was still a level of progression in that, so you can just go straight for the most powerful. Um, so you have to pick something from the core to get something from the tier two. Uh, and there are tier threes as well, but they're not in this document. Um, so you can have that sort of progression up, uh, upwards. And the same is true for the magic abilities as well. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate that that both of them are unified in this sense, for one and for two. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is still using the energy resource instead of instead of um, the more Vancian approach, which I will never like. I will only at best tolerate okay uh, i'm not sure what you're referring to um the spell the the whole spells per day and have and having to re having oh. to plan them and then re and then you can't nah, use them nah. again until <laughs> until a long rest i hated nah. i hated that when i started and that has not changed yeah uh, yeah that that is not something um i'm a fan of either uh so yeah, having just having basic energy resource that everybody uses for everything just makes everything so much simpler. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to and um, when it, and of course that whole with that that applies just as much with the um with the magic abilities. I'm guessing mm. as things develop, there's going to be more types than just. Elemental magic. Uh, yeah, so there are again um, not in this document. Um, we so elemental magic I put in here because it is one of the most sort of like how do I put this? It's I guess it's the area of magic that I'm most proud of uh, as as one of that I've developed um, because of the way it interacts with each other, with the versatility involved. Um, and just the whole way that it's set up. There are uh, others. We also have there's a discipline of magic called arcane, which is like all this sort of like tips, tricks that you imagine sort of like a, a wizard might pull, like teleporting, counter spells, uh, you know, like blasts of energy, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's also divine magic, which is like more holy and devilish uh, abilities, as well as necromancy and um, druidic kind of stuff, like plant control. Uh, and the last one is forbidden magic, which is what we called it, which is uh, like psychic and blood, mm. uh, sort of more sort of like eldritchy stuff. Uh, since we're dealing, since you brought up blood magic, is that is that going to mm -hmm. be a case of casting from health? A bit of both. Um, so what my whole most of those abilities work is that you do have to spend the energies because that's a resource. Um, but there's also like a, you can spend health to increase the power. Um, and the main reason it's not just a HP resource is because otherwise the most powerful blood mages would just be the tanks, <laughs> which is not necessarily what we wanted. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah, I can. I can certainly. I can certainly get that. Now, with with that in with that in mind, when it comes to it, when it, come, when it came to. Um, equipment. Um, mm -hmm. I something I did I I did notice that you that the um, start the starting equipment funds are based on your your CP levels. So I'm guessing that I'm guessing that's a way to have it that e that if somebody's doing a high powered game, you're not yeah. 
um, having them limited to the basic <laughs> line of equipment. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is also... Uh, they're not in this document again, uh, but there is um, backgrounds uh, in, in our main document which allows you to get equipment packages from the start as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the equipment funds multiply by CLP. Yeah, so if you want to come in starting out with 30 CP characters, uh, if you're really powerful team, then you can have them be equipped with good good stuff. Yeah. Uh, I am curious about some about some, I am curious about some of the key some of the keywords. Mm -hmm. Um some of them some of them I can I can I can kind of get I can kind of get but is and I I was I was gonna ask on some of them but then I see that you have listed out the um key, the keyword list. Yeah. The I think now is it a is it a case where um it it'd be very te it'd be very tempting in a lot of in a lot of games to have the to not to not have magic targeting um weapons um when I look at things like ma magic staves would those would using the, would using some of those still count as um as physical attacks uh yeah so um. The, the typical sort of weapon profile on the magic staff is for if you're just hitting them with a stick, <laughs> um, but then they give you a bonus to magic abilities that you cast using them, or cast while you're holding them. Mm -hmm. like, a, like extra range or extra damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am I know that you have shields in the equipment list, but I am curious if through talents or something else, you are going to provide the opportunity for a shield bash. Uh, yeah, shield bash is a martial ability. You can pick it up. Because mm -hmm. a lot of games, just, a lot of games just have it as just have shields as a defense bonus. You know, you know, it's it's not like mm. it's not like armies like the Spartans had <laughs> had whole doctrines about beat about beating the opponent's face <laughs> in with the, with that giant ass shield. Yeah, is you can definitely play uh, like we've had people play that sort of like um, riot enforcer kind of character with the armor and the big shield uh, mm -hmm. and like an electro prod, <laughs> um, and you can definitely just smack people with a shield if you want. <laughs> um, I do. I I do remember. I do remember one of one of my players deciding to do something um, incredibly incredibly bold and incredibly stupid with his. Um, sh with his particular shield, he w mm -hmm. he didn't want to do sword and board. He wanted to do full board. And right, <laughs> yeah, for... funny coincidence. One of my friends has that exact same idea. Well, here here's how we made it worse. Right. He aff he affixed a recharging ring of ram to his shield. Okay. Which which means which means that he which means that he could hit with the shield and still have it count as a bull rush. Right. So what he would end he would end up doing is do, is doing these charging attacks and and basically bullying the battlefield by sending <laughs> and by sending anything his size or smaller flying. That's that's uh, a great concept. Uh, <laughs> I like I like that. Uh, the the appro the approach that he took was. When he says "get out of the damn way," he he actively means that unless you want, <laughs> unless you want to get pinballed, because <laughs> I take wait I t I take way too many ideas from wa from watching o from watching old um, Chuck Jones cartoons, <laughs> even even stuff even stuff like the um, I read a rune trap called the up button that sends you flying straight straight up for six se for six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> If if somebody steps on it, basically, basically the spring. Um, I've, I've had, I've had, I had re, I reflavored, um, meteor swarm to be um anvil rain, <laughs> which is exactly what you think it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's because the the idea of of fl of flaming rocks falling from the sky that's everybody everybody's done that. <laughs> There's nothing new with that, but 
There's a certain level of insult in de in <laughs> death by falling anvils. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So I I've I've had it where somebody had 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 written summon monster as one of their spells, but they misspelled monster, so it looked like monster. I'm like, <laughs> nope, no take backs. You su you summon a giant block of cheese. Mm, that's the interpretation you take there. Okay. <laughs> You know that's that sort of that sort of cr that sort of crazy. Um, <laughs> now, are you familiar with the concept of Appendix N? Not particularly. Oh, um, that was a that was a um, kind of an inspirational media list that was put in the back end of early D and D books and similar right. similar segment segments in in um, books following that mm -hmm. um, appendix then became kind of a shorthand for that concept right and i'm cur i'm curious what some of the um what some of the media whether it be whether it be film whether it be tv whether it be comics whether it be mm -hmm. video games would be on steel and scales appendix n oh um <laughs> Well, first and foremost, um, you know the video game Dishonored? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it has become a little bit of a meme among my friend group that uh, Steel and Scale, it, it, don't worry guys, it's not just Dishonored. Because um, that was definitely when I was, when I was taking us forward to this time period and describing how the setting was going to be, it was definitely very reminiscent of Dishonored. Uh, but it has grown beyond that, um, and there are other inspirations as, as well. Um, uh, in general, things that are set around that time period are great to look at um, and to to draw upon. Um, oh, there... Sorry, you sprung this on me, and I'm <laughs> trying to think. Um, Has anyone brought up Arcanum to you? I I know Arcanum is steampunk, but it it but it is leaning into that meshing of magic and technology. No, I have not heard of that. Um, hmm. Oh, actually, I think I might have seen this. Before. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's obviously a bit more steampunk than than the vibe we're going for is. Uh, there's also, do you know, Carnival Row, TV series. That, that mm -hmm. was a great inspiration for a lot of the more city-focused uh, areas of the setting, and the sort of mesh of magical creatures with uh, industry. Um, and and we've also had a few games that have been set more in the uh, this area that we call the frontier, this sort of deserty area uh, on the edge of the empire. Uh, which is definitely more inspired by westerns. Um, we've had a, a few campaigns set in the sort of western um, areas, um, <clears throat> and we've had like eldritch style stuff that's more inspired by the, you know the works of like H.P. Lovecraft and uh, and the spin-offs of mm -hmm. the sort of cosmic horror mm -hmm. kind of genre. Yeah, you'd so it all comes from. All yeah, you'd probably you'd probably get a kick out of the um, Lovecraft Historical Society. Uh... They're a performance group that's do that's done a series called Dark Adventure Radio Theater, which is turning some of Lovecraft's stories into an old school radio drama. Right, right, okay. Um, they also they also the mm -hmm. only film that they that they've done that I know is a is essentially Call of Cthulhu, but in a um, in the st in the style of a of a silent expressionist film. <laughs> okay. Uh, that and a, a couple Christmas albums, although Christmas albums with their particular stamp. So mm. you have songs like <laughs> "Freddy the Red Br the Red Brained Migo." Um, it's beginning to look a lot like Fishman. <laughs> <laughs> and I caught I saw mommy kissing Yog Sagoth. 
know, that's, that's... And, of course, Carol of the Old Ones, which, mm. true story, actually <laughs> tricked a... Um, actually actually tricked a choir um, to, to sing that until, until they realized it was too late. Because <laughs> uh, I, want, I wanted to spice up the hell of, ha of everyone having to listen to Christmas music. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Not quite at that. Not quite in the Christmas months yet. No, <laughs> but I, I have to suffer through it because I have friends in the Philippines, and they uh, do it much longer than we do. Right. Right. Like, I, <laughs> I think some of them have already started if they ha are if they're not planning on it, and mm. it goes all the way through. It goes all the way <laughs> through the end of the year, which, no. <laughs> I can barely tolerate one week of that. I'm not doing. Th I'm not doing four months. Yeah. <laughs> but with, I'm within the, within the full book. Do you have plans on su on supporting um, people making custom equipment, like custom weapons and armor? Um, we don't necessarily have. Um, well. Kind of is is like there. So there is uh, in in the main, in the draft of the book there is a, a background called Tinkerer, which lets you sort of merge two weapons together. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's something. There's also a talent called Inventor that lets you that you make uh, like a suit of power armor, basically, but like clunky diesel punk power armor, mm -hmm. and you can customize that. Um, but beyond that, uh, there's not really anything in place for full customization, but also like GMs are free to, you know, make up whatever want, stuff they want. Um, and one of our stretch goals on the Kickstarter is including a list of uh, like uh, unique items and, and that can be, you know, used as inspiration for, uh, you know, gadgets and uh, and weapons and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, know, I know that one of the recurring ones that I've used and reskin depending on what sort of setup is basically an XP of the noisy cricket gun from Men in Black. Oh right, yeah. <laughs> you know, does a hell of a lot of damage, but you fire the thing, you will be knocked on your Flying ass back. about <laughs> twenty feet. <laughs> oh, like that? Because I like giving my players very powerful but very unsafe equipment. <laughs> Especially if, especially if it's a setting where invention is kind of a thing, because mm. um, the early the early inventor eras were a very wild time. I, I suppose the best analog I can go with is the early days of aviation. Mm. Um, there was yeah. a whole lot of crazy going about. <laughs> yeah, um, and we definitely sort of leaned into a lot of that um, mm -hmm. with this with this book, sort of wacky wacky gadgets, wacky inventions. Yeah, so if mm. you can. And how well, you you even have um you even have clock you even have clockwork as a um ra as a race for people who yeah. want to go that go that far and have the somebody's inevitably going to have a, the mechanical butler. It's going to happen if it hasn't <laughs> happened already. Yeah, yeah. Well, it has in some of our home campaigns. It definitely has. <laughs> oh. um, I mean, it's a good vibe. It's a good. It's a good character. Yeah. Um... <laughs> and. With now, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as the page count total for the book? Um, so our draft version of the book is currently at two hundred and twenty-five pages. Uh, a lot of that taken up with abilities and stuff, um, especially like all the extra magic that I mentioned. That takes up a lot of space. Um, but that probably will change a bit as format as we format and we add uh, illustrations, uh, which is the main sort of thing left to do uh, with the book. Um, but I'm looking at around that account. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I, I can certainly get that. It's that's going to be a reasonable uh, size. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to go too big. Mm -hmm. uh, and with with that in with that in mind. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. No worries. You have nice decor in here. 
<laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been it's been good. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!